Yeah, uh, nine. Three point eight number nine. This is a uh, application of related rates, cones. Cones seem to be a uh, pretty fun shape to use when you're talking about how fast things change, simply because as as the height in a cone changes, so does the radius, and they change at a rate that's proportional to each other, so they do make good problems. So here's one that's ripped from, not the headlines, but from the pages of my diary. Um, a cherry-flavored raspa, also called a snow cone, uh, is leaking from its paper cone at a rate of two cubic inches per minute. Uh, the paper cone's top radius is two inches, and and it's five inches tall. When the depth of the melted cherry raspa mixture is three inches, how fast is the radius of the raspa changing? Okay, so yeah, I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley, and every day after school, uh, we would stop at the little raspa stand, and we would get a raspa for like a quarter, okay? And they were always in these, I mean, now they're like in styrofoam cups, you know, and you get these big, tall spoons. It's like gourmet ice. This was not gourmet ice. I mean, it was chunky ice, man. It was like, I mean... Sometimes they didn't even grind it up for you. Um, 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 but, you know, it always it always started leaking, and it always started leaking all over my clothes. So uh, the goal was to try and do it without being incredibly messy, which I always failed. So let's see what we got here. It's leaking from the cone at a rate of two cubic inches per minute. So two cubic inches per minute, bless you. That's going to be a rate of change, and that's going to be changing the what inside the cone. Cubic inches is a measure of volume. So we can call that DVDT. Now, if we're talking about the mixture in the cone, would that be a positive or a negative rate? It's negative because the volume in the cone is, is decreasing, right, and falling onto my clothes. So it's a negative rate. Um, we got some, quote, unquote, rigid measurements of this paper cone here. The top radius is two inches, so I'm going to go ahead and use black here. This right here is a fixed two inches, and the height is a fixed five inches. Okay, so those, those are immutable somewhat, right? Not really, but for the point of this problem. Now we're saying, okay, here's our moment in time. When the depth of the cone melt is three inches, so... What's variable is the actual fluid inside. So here is the snapshot moment. Um, the depth is three. So this is going to be the snapshot moment when that is three. And of course, we also have another variable, which is right here. So there are two variables in the cone problem. And I'm going to call this one R, right? the radius of the melt. And I'm going to call this one H. Or you can call it D, but I'm going to call it H. Okay, so the 5 and the 2 stay the same, but the radius of the melt and the height of the melt, H and R, those both change. So that's our snapshot moment when H is 3. I'm going to make kind of a big camera there. Okay, so we've got everything set up. We've got everything labeled, and it's time to answer the questions. How fast is the radius changing? So on part A, we're looking for dr, dt. That's our target. And what I need to do is somehow relate, I don't know how I'm going to do this yet, but I need to relate DRDT to DVDT um, and maybe by way of H somehow. So we need to relate the quantities first. So in a cone, how do you relate the volume to the radius and to the height? Well, it's the volume of a cone. So here's one you need to know. The volume of a cone is high thirds R squared H. That's the volume of a cone. A right circular cone. All right, it's a, it's a third of the uh, cylinder from which it's carved. So let's see. Now that I've related them, I can take the derivative. Now, if you take the derivative right now, you're going to have to use the product rule, which is fine. We know how to do that. You're going to need to know R at the moment. You're going to need to know H at the moment. And you're also going to generate a DRDT and a DHDT. So you will need to be able to relate R to H in every cone problem. So let's do that. How am I going to relate R to H in this problem? Anyone see it? You got this big triangle, and you got this little triangle inside of it. So we can actually re relate those proportionally, right? Similar triangles is going to be the way to go. Similar triangles. And there's a couple ways to set up your uh, proportion, right? You can go 
uh, big to small, or you can go corresponding sides, whatever. So I'm not sure how you want to do it. I'm just going to go 2 is to 5 as what is to what? R is to H, right? You could say 2 is to R as 5 is to H. doesn't really matter. Your cross product should be the same. So if you do that, you're going to get 2H equals 5R, and that would be your cross product, however you set it up. So what that allows us to do then, it allows us to either solve for H in terms of R, H would be 5 halves R, or if you wanted, you could solve it for R. R would be 2 fifths of H, either one of them. This is kind of like the holy grail, the key that unlocks all the cone problems, because not only does it relate the H to the R, the height to the radius, it also relates their rates to each other, right? Because all you have to do is take the derivative of both sides. <clears throat> okay, well, that's, I guess, what we could do over here. And if you wanted to, you could do that right now. Let's, let's see. We got dh dt. That would equal 5 halves dr dt. So if we need that, we got it. And, of course, the other one would be dr dt equals 2 fifths dh dt. So that similar triangle relation not only relates the height to the radius, it relates their rates of change. Okay, so really what you could do is you can like fill in now some more information on that snapshot moment before we even get going. All I know at the moment is the depth of my snow cone mixture is 3. I could figure out what the radius is now at the same moment, right? Forensically, right? What do I do? I plug in a 3 for H right here and I get... 3 times 2 is 6 fifths, right? 6 fifths. So that's the radius at the moment. Okay, cool. Um, what do we do? Oh, we're going back to the question. We're trying to find DRDT. Now, I have DRDT right here already found. It's 2 fifths of DHDT, but do I know what DHDT is? Was that given? No. So I do have to go through the volume because that's the only rate that was given. So you have some options here. You can either take the derivative using the product rule, and you'll plug in your R, your H, and your DRDT, and your HDT. Or, and this is another option you have uh, with any cone problem, you can make your volume exclusively, before you take the derivative, a function of R or a function of H. And how do you decide which one to use? Well, if I'm trying to find DRDT, I'd like to have a R in my equation, right? So here's option one. You can go ahead and make it a function of R by replacing H. Well, what is H in terms of R? Let's mosey over here. H is 5 halves R. So we'll come back over here, 5 halves R. And if I simplify that, I get, uh, let's see, what do I get? I get 5 pi 6 r cubed. So this is a volume formula that allows you to determine how much slush is in the bottom of the cone just by knowing the radius of the slush mixture. Okay, You could do something equivalently and get it exclusively in terms of H if you needed to. So this is going to make the derivative easier, right? Because I don't have to use the product rule and I'm actually eliminating two variables. I'm eliminating H and the HDT. So let's go ahead and take the derivative now with respect to time. And you get dvdt equals, what do we get? 5 pi, let's see, 3 6 is 1 half, r squared times drdt. And so notice now to evaluate drdt, which is what we're after, we just need to know dvdt at the moment, and we need to know the radius at the moment. I think we know both of those, right? So referencing the moment in time when h equals 3, even though there's no H in the equation, it still references the same moment. When H equals 3, we get dv dt, which is negative 2, uh, equals 5 pi halves times R at the moment. We found that, right? If we hadn't found that yet, we would need to go find it. It happens to be 6 fifths. So we can plug that in. 6 fifths squared times dr dt. And then it's just a matter of carefully solving. So if I multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 5 pi halves, I get negative 4 over 5 pi. And then 6 fifths squared is 36 25th. So if I put its reciprocal on the other side, that should work. 
36 25th. Just a little bit of uh, manipulating of an equation. Whatever you're comfortable doing, kind of get in your own zone and solve for the RDT on your own. Um, let's see, some, some things now work in my favor here. This 5 divides out with that 25 and calls it a 5. This 4 goes into itself once, goes into 36 nine times. And so we can maybe come up with a simplified version. The RDT is negative 5 over 9 pi. Nice. I think that's it. I think that's all that's left. Let me make this a little longer. There we go. So an interesting number, an accurate number. All this data was actually collected in real time back in the day. Um, what would be the units on that then? We're talking about inches per minute. Yeah, inches per minute. All right. So there you go. You've answered one of the questions. When the depth of the mixture is three inches, the radius is decreasing by five, nine pi inches per minute. Now, <clears throat> there is another thing. I'll just show you right here because this could happen. You need to be able to just in your, you know, in your mental frame when you come into these problems, be ready to solve for in, uh, volume in terms of either variable. So let's just go ahead and write it in terms of H as well. Okay, so if you leave H in there and you want to get rid of R, you've got to be careful because you're squaring it. What is R in terms of H? Well, R is 2 fifths H. So if you come over here, you can replace that with 2 fifths H. And now when you simplify, you just got to be a little bit more cautious because you're squaring it. So 2 squared is 4 times pi would be 4 pi. And then 5 squared is 25 times 3 makes it 75. And then H squared times H is H cubed. So here would be the volume formula exclusively in terms of the height, which would be real easy if you wanted to figure out what the HDT was. <clears throat> of course, you did have the option of using the product rule and then plugging everything in. All right, so there's part A. Um, now part B. It says, how fast is the snow cone melt, the raspa, leaking onto my clothes, which it always did? How fast is it leaking onto my Assume that my clothes are sitting directly under the, because I didn't use napkins. This is my napkin. What is that? Yeah. So here, here are my clothes. Here's my, here's my, here's my clothes right there. It's, I wore blue a lot, so there's my clothes. If it's leaking out of the cone at two in, cubic inches per minute, guess how fast it's going onto my clothes? Two inches per minute. So. Let's call that DC DT for D closed DT, okay? And it's still two cubic inches per minute, but what's the sign? Positive. Positive, because it's accumulating on my clothes. So this is a very common type of idea with these cone problems. The rate at which it's leaking out could be the rate at which it's going into something else. But the first rate is negative, and the second rate is positive. Whether it's snow cone juice onto your clothes, or, like on the test last year, it's coffee coming out of a maker into a uh, decanter. Okay? All right, so that's, that's all we're doing for Part B. Part C, if, if I have a small cylindrical cup, and I did, with a 2-inch diameter beneath the leaking snow cone, at this exact same moment, how fast is the height of the juice in that catch cup, we called it, changing? All right, so what kind of a catch cup am I talking about? You know those little pleated paper cups that, like, tartar sauce comes in? They have, like, little paper pleats across the top. They're real tiny. That's what they had. They had that sitting up there, you know. And you just – the idea was, was to not get it on your clothes and use both hands in the whole process. And then you would just, you know, have that cup right here, and there would be the pleats, you know, and it would catch, it would catch the, the juice as it went down. But the problem is – the thing was so small, and it was also paper. And, of course, once you get it wet, yeah, then this started leaking, and then that's another problem, too. So, yeah, then you need another one. You need a third hand. So, yeah, that was life in the valley. So, anyway, uh, it was hard. It had a two-inch diameter, okay? So that's interesting. I'm giving you the diameter. And because this one is a cylinder, 
let's, let's see what's different about that. If the diameter was 2, the radius was what? Yeah, good. 1. Huh. And that doesn't change. That's rigid. Okay? Now, here's what's cool. As this fill, filled up, unlike the cone, where as it fills up, the radius gets bigger, or as it leaks, the radius gets smaller, what can you say about the radius the whole time as this fills up? It's a constant. It fills up all the way across. So radius of 1 is a constant. You don't have to label the radius of the cylinder because it's a constant. That's cool. Now, what's different? The height will change. Now, I don't want to call the height of the fluid in the catch cup H because I call this the fluid in the snow cone H. So I'm going to call it something else like Y. Okay. All right, so let's, let's backtrack now. At that same exact moment, how fast is the height changing? Well, now that I've called it Y, I'm looking for the Y dt. That's what I'm looking for. All right, so you can actually call the CDT, the rate at which it was collecting on my clothes. Assuming now I get my clothes out of the way and get the catch cup back under place, that could be the rate of change of the volume of the catch cup, right? But I don't want to call it V for volume because I called this V for volume. And you don't want to reuse variables in the same problem. So what I typically do, because back in the day I listened to them as well, I call it Van Halen V, okay, for volume. If you want to call it W or whatever, that's fine. I'm going to let Van Halen V be the volume of the cylinder. So that's what I'm looking for down here. So what is the volume, the Van Halen volume, of a cylinder? Oh, that's a sphere. Uh, in general, it's pi r squared h. Remember, the cone is pi thirds r squared h. The cylinder is just pi r squared h. But that's straight off of a formula chart in your head. You want to make it very specific now for your problem. So pi is pi. What do we know about our radius in our little catch cup cylinder? It's 1. It's a constant. And remember, if it's a constant throughout the life of the problem, you plug it in before you take the derivative. And, of course, my H is not H. I'm calling it Y. So here we go. My volume, my Van Halen volume, is just pi Y. There you go. Pi E. Pi E. <laughs> now I can take the derivative of both sides with respect to T. And I get pi dy dt. And I'm almost there. The same moment in time. So when h equals 3, that's the height of the snow cone mixture up above. When that's 3, the height of the catch cup is changing. At, we'll find it. All i got to do is plug in. So what's d van Halen v dt? It's positive 2 positive 2, and that equals pi dy dt. So we're almost there. We just divide 3 by pi, and we get 2 over pi. There we go, 2 over pi. And what would the units be? Units of y, that's units of height. That would be inches per minute. Yeah. There you go. A very typical cone problem. Kind of got a system going on there. So pi thirds r squared h and pi r squared h. In a cylinder, the radius is a constant as it fills up or lowers. In the cone, the radius and the height both change proportionally to each other. And you can always find the relation between their quantities and their rates by using what? Similar triangles. Yeah. Okay. Sweet Onito. Okay, cherry wasn't actually my favorite uh, flavor back in the day. It was just the only one that I can find on Google Images, so I made it match. Okay. No, no, that was just kind of like little trivia. The angle of repose of any material is the uh, is, is the self-correcting angle at which the the material will 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 sit due to its consistency and the effect of gravity. So. Um, yeah, 
and, and it's different for different substances. In this case, it was 45. If you keep piling stuff on, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pile up here, and then after a while, the pile is going to break and shift, and it'll start sliding down. And that angle is always unique depending on whatever the, the, the material is. So that's all that is. Um, I like grape, but I did I did go with the suicide quite a bit, you know, or it's just like put a little put a little pump of everything. Did you pump it yourself? No, they pumped it inside. Yeah, I was busy swat, swatting the flies away while they did all that. There were a lot of flies down in the valley. We didn't have air conditioning when I learned, so it was windows were open and we had this old like government issued paper that was brown and I remember working math problems and beads of sweat would just fall right there on my math paper. I was just, man, I wish I had a raspa. I wish I had a raspa. Okay, anyway, good old days, good old days. All right, so um, la, 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 la. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, gonna, I'm going to let the, 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 the cone problem sink in, okay? And we're going to skip example 10 and perhaps come back to it. We're going to jump to example 11. And if there's time, we'll come back to example 10 and see if you remember the cone stuff. Huh? All right, so example 10 is the last one on here. Uh, a young boy is out at night. Also from my diary, yeah. <laughs> Running towards a street lamp at six feet per second. If the street lamp is 30 feet tall, and it was, and the boy is five feet tall in his running stance, okay, when he's four feet from the base of the lamppost, two questions. How fast is his shadow length changing, and how fast is the tip of his shadow moving? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So is that the same question? Shadow length changing and tip of the shadow moving? That's two different questions. <laughs> there should be two different answers. Let's try to make sense of what's going on here. Here's a flat street. You had a lamp post. Here's the lamp post. And there was a light at the top. And it was uh let's see, I think it was mercury vapor, not sodium vapor. And uh it was can it was uh how tall was it? Thirty feet. So we'll assume that that didn't move. It was it was thirty feet tall, okay? Thirty feet. So I'm not gonna call that elf a lamp post. It's a constant. Now, the way that this works, you know, is it, it shines a light, um, and then there's a person five feet tall, right about here, we'll say, um, and they'll assume that's a constant, right? That doesn't change. And um, the light is shining down in front, but, of course, he's blocking some of it with his height like that. Okay, and so... Uh, the light's shining back here. There you go. You could do this with notability pretty nicely. There you go. And so he's blocking the light with his body. And so there you go. Five is a constant. Thirty is a constant. Now, let's go ahead and label. He's running towards the lamppost, so he's running this way. So there's a couple of things here that are changing. First of all, let's label the shadow, right? The shadow is going to be projected on the ground, and I'm going to call that S for shadow, script letter S. So it doesn't look like five. The distance then from the base of the lamppost is also changing. What do you want to call that? I'll call it X. Remember, we're getting in the habit again of labeling small pieces. So uh, instead of labeling the whole thing from the base of the lamppost to the tip of the shadow of something and then using subtraction, we'll just call the small pieces X and S. Okay, so what else do we know? I think that's, that's it for labeling. Now we can label something in here. It says he's running towards the lamp at six feet per second. So I know that six feet per second is some kind of rate, and it's d something dt, and it's the rate of change of some linear quantity. So based upon my labeling down there, is it anything that I've labeled? D what dt? It's dx dt. Good, because we're referencing the base of the lamppost. And would it be positive or negative? It's negative, good, because X is getting smaller, decreasing. All right, <clears throat> so we know that. And then it says, part A, how fast is his shadow length changing? What did I label the shadow length here? S. 
So on part A, we're looking for ds dt. All right, so here's the fun part, coming up with that equation. I need to ultimately relate the rates to each other, but I first must relate the quantities to each other. So in this little picture, how do I relate S to X? Yeah, similar triangles again, right? It, it's, uh, it becomes the primary equation now and not just the secondary equation to relate R and H in the cone. Let's see, so um, I'll say 30 is to 5. I'll do it a different way now. 30 is to 5, that's the two verticals, big to small, as the big horizontal length, X plus S, is to the small horizontal length, right? Does that work? You could also say 30 is to X plus S, as 5 is to S, as long as they correspond. Your cross product should be the same. I did this because 30 over 5 is 6, so that's nice. So if I multiply both sides by S, I get 6S equals X plus S. So you don't have to leave it in that format. You could solve it for any variable you want and simplify as much as you want. If you're trying to find the SDT, you might want to solve it explicitly for S, if you can, if it's not too much problem. And I think this one's not that bad. If you subtract an S, you get 5S equals X. So leave it like that, or solve for S. S equals a fifth of X. So that's a pretty easy little equation. That's your position equation. That relates the shadow to the distance from the lamppost. So we'll take the derivative now with respect to time, and we get the derivative of S with respect to T is one-fifth dx dt. Remember, DXCT is how fast the dude's running. All right, so now the moment in time. We didn't do that. When he's four feet from the base of the lamppost, so our snapshot moment is when X equals four. Someone's taking a picture. Maybe the guy he's running from. When X equals four. <laughs> now, notice I say when X equals four, but your equation doesn't even have X in it, does it? It's just a function of how fast he's running. So, DSDT... Uh, is equal to one-fifth of dx dt, and dx dt was negative six. There you go. So we end up with dx dt equaling either negative six-fifths, or as a decimal, what would that be? Negative 1.2, if you multiply by 2 over 2. And what would the units be? Let's see, he's running in miles per hour? No feet per second, feet per second. So when he's four feet from the base of the lamppost, his shadow length is decreasing by about 1.2 feet per second. Is that a constant rate of change of shadow length? If we assume he's running at a constant rate, because it did say otherwise, then the SDT is one-fifth times the constant. It should be a constant, right? So the whole time he's running towards the, the, the pole, the shadow is de getting smaller at a constant rate. So I don't know if you've ever done that, been out in the dark and run towards a lamppost, and as you're running towards a lamppost, turn around and look at your shadow and just notice that it does get smaller kind of at a constant rate until you hit the lamppost and you're like, dang. Yeah. When your shadow is this long, you might want to turn around and, and maybe put on the instantaneous brakes. Yeah, so it does appear to get smaller at a constant rate. Um, now, part two, part two. How fast is the tip of the shadow moving? That's a little bit different, right? The shadow length is changing at a constant rate, but the tip of the shadow is right there. And if you want to figure out how fast it's moving, just like when you're talking about how fast the dude is moving, it's all in reference to the base of the lamppost. So what are we looking for then on part B? We're looking for the rate of change of some quantity with respect to T. It would be this whole length down here on the bottom. That's how far this is from the bottom of the lamppost. So what are we calling that length? X plus S, yeah. So we're looking for this. Now, how in the heck do we do that? Well, remember that when I say dy dt, that's just the same as the derivative with respect to t of y. You just typically put it into the numerator. 
So when you say the derivative of x plus s with respect to t, you're also doing the same thing as that, right? And now we're just taking the derivative with respect to t of two quantities, which if you want to call that something like tip, I don't know if you want to call that the tip, the tip of the shadow is x plus s. You could do that and then dt, dt, whatever. But this is just going to be by the rules of derivatives. It's going to be the derivative of x with respect to t plus the derivative of s with respect to t. And so it turns out that we're just going to be doing what with the two rates that we found? Adding them together. So uh, when the boy is four feet away, the tip is moving, we'll say dt, dt, whatever, is going to equal negative 6 minus, and whatever we found over here, 1.2. So negative 7.2 feet per second. Now this is a pretty scary scenario because the boy is running through the lamppost at 6 feet per second. The tip of his shadow is running towards the lamppost at 7.2 feet per second. The tip of the shadow is running faster than he is, which means it's going to it's going to get him. It's going to get him. Maybe that's what he's running from, right? And what's funny is the faster he runs, the faster his shadow runs, and it's going to get him. It's going to get him at the lamppost. Yeah, okay. So there you go. There's that problem. Uh, that one's kind of an interesting problem. It shows up every once in a while. But that idea of similar triangles then... Um, very important here as we close out uh, the section. All righty. Any questions on that one? Huh? Um, eventually. Eventually. Yeah, yeah. After the concussion and he screams uh, stranger danger and people came out from their homes and uh, he ended up being okay. All right. I don't know whatever happened with the picture that the guy took. Um, <clears throat> by the way, notice, did it matter in that whole problem that he was four feet from the base of the lamppost? No, all that stuff is going to be constant regardless of where he is from the lamppost, assuming that he's close enough to still, you know, cast a shadow. He can't be like three blocks away necessarily. That would be a bright light. But as long as he's uh, close enough to the light to cast a shadow and everything else stays the same, uh, th those numbers will work. So you could have referenced the moment in time to be anything. All right, let's look at example 10. I plucked this one off of the 1984 exam. Uh, it was it was a question number five. And uh, I remember there was something interesting about it, and I don't remember what it was. But it was it was another cone problem on a free response. And they've had a few cone problems uh, related rates as full-fledged free response questions. All right, so let's see what happened back in 1984. That was a great year. That was a great year. That was not the year, by the way, Van Halen's 1984 album came out, by the way. Um, it came out, uh, I think, a, a year or two before that. Interesting. Uh, the volume V of a cone is increasing at a rate of 28 cubic inches per second. At the instant when the radius of the cone is 3 inches, its volume is 12 cubic inches, and the radius is increasing at a half inch per second. So... Um, at that instant, when the radius is 3, what's the rate of change of the area of the base of the cone? All right. Step one, what would you do? The clock's ticking. You've got about 15 minutes per problem to work one of these. This was a non-calculator one. Would you draw a picture? No. I don't know. Would you? Okay, it got real quiet. Let's draw the cone the other way instead of a, instead of uh, instead of the the Raspa cone. Let's do this one like that. Okay, there's my cone, and I know that it has a radius, which I'll call R, and it has a height, H. Okay, so the volume is increasing. So I'm going to call V for volume. So dV dt. This is all just the preliminary stuff. It equals positive or negative 28. Positive because it's increasing. Okay. Uh, cubic inches per second. I'm going to go ahead and put my units there just to try and remind myself that I need to put units on all my final answers. And I am talking about inches in second, not like feet and hours. At the instant when the radius is 3, so the snapshot moment is when R equals 3. 
its volume is 12. Oh, okay, so I can squeeze that in there. The volume is 12. And the radius is increasing. So at that moment, the radius is increasing. So dr dt at that moment is one half inches per second. So that's a lot of information. So we've, we've made sense of everything. We've got it labeled. All right, part A. And this is how they said it back in 84. They kind of repeated it again. At the instant when the radius is 3, so at that snapshot moment, what's the rate of change of the area of the base? Okay, well, if you look at the base of the cone, it's a what? It's a circle, okay? So we're looking for the dA dt. Well, I need to somehow relate A to R. What is it? Pi R squared. All right, so then uh, I'll take the derivative with respect to time, and we get dA dt equals 2 pi r times dr dt. And I'm solved now for the variable I want, and I just need r and dr dt at the moment. Do I have them? Heck yeah, I have them. They gave them to me. So we'll reference the moment in time when r equals 3. We get dA dt equals 2 times pi times 3 times 1 half. Keeping in mind it's a free response, can we stop there? Yeah, everything, the parentheses are intact. We just better put units. Units of area over units of time would be square inches per second, right? Square inches per second. Now, in case I need to use that, or just for like uh, demonstration purposes, maybe, I'll go ahead and simplify that. That becomes uh, 3 pi. And that's, that's one that maybe you irresistibly want to simplify anyway for the bonus points, right? No, 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 none. Okay. Um, you're going to get points for that. Probably more than one. Probably a couple of points for that. They don't have the scoring guidelines for 1984, but... I, w I would imagine at least one. They don't ever ask you to do something and then not give you any points. So you got at least one out of nine, maybe two. All right, part B. You know, it could be that these are uh, three, three, and three. So maybe you got three for that, three for each part. At the instant when the radius of the cone is three inches, referencing the same snapshot moment, what's the rate of change of the height? Okay, so on part B, we're looking for dh dt. I need to somehow then relate the height to any of the other stuff that I have available. How am I going to do that? Through volume. Through volume. Excellent. Because they told me what the volume is, and I know what dvdt is, so that's what we're going to do. So the volume of a cone, and notice it's not up here anywhere. We've got to pull it out of our mind, which is pi thirds r squared h. Uh-huh. Now, if we're looking for dH dt, I guess you have the option, like I told you, of putting it in terms of a single variable if you can come up with a relation between R and H. Can we do that right now? Do we know what R and H are? Do we know what the measurements are? No, but here's what we can do. We know the volume is 12 when the radius is 3, yeah? So I can actually figure out what it is right there. So let's go ahead and figure that out. Um, I'm going to find H right here. I'm going to find what H is at that moment. So the volume would be 12. I'd get pi thirds. R would be 3 squared times H. So it looks like H would be, um, if I simplify the right, that's 9 thirds, that's 3 pi. It should be 12 over 3 pi, which means H is going to be 4 over pi. So maybe I'll remodel my camera here, and I'll stick that in there, and that would be inches. So it's a final numeric answer. Even if I'm finding it on my own, I'm just going to put it up there. Do we know the ratio now between R and H? We could. Yeah, we could do that. Um, here's what I'm going to do. Since I know R and dr dt, you could actually just take the derivative using the product rule. You have all the information. Let's go ahead and do that. Since we did it the other way that last time, let's just go ahead and use the product rule. We'll take the derivative with respect to time. 
and we get dv dt equals, by the product rule, we get 2 pi thirds r to the first times the chain rule dr dt times h goes along for the ride. Plus, I'm going to go ahead and just pull pi thirds r squared along with it instead of factoring out the pi thirds times the derivative of h, which is 1, times the chain rule dh dt. Now, when you use the product rule, of course, you're going to have a lot more variables, but if you know them all, that's good. So notice if we're looking for dh dt, that would be the one unknown that we're allowed not to know. So real quickly, you can go through and take inventory. Do you know all the others at the moment? Well, yeah, I know dv dt. They gave it. Um, I know the radius at the moment. Yeah. Um, I know dr dt. They gave that. Here's where you would be like, ah, I don't know what h is. If you hadn't found it already, they're like, darn it, I need to know what h is. Well, how would you find h? You would realize then that they gave you what the volume is, and then you would come off to the side and find h. So it doesn't really matter the order in which you find h. You're just going to need it eventually. So you can find it when you need it or get it in advance. So I think we have everything. So now when, and our moment in time is when r equals 3. Uh, we plug in everything we know, and there's all kinds of numbers floating around. So it's easy to mess up. Be diligent. 28 equals 2 pi thirds times r, which is 3, times dr dt, which is 1 half, times h, which we found to be the fantastic number, 4 over pi, plus pi thirds, pi thirds. Plus sign, okay. Plus pi thirds times r squared. That's going to be nine times the h dt. Wow, that looks pretty ugly. Um, let's see what happens here. A couple things. These threes divide out. Um, this two divides out with that two. This pi divides out with that. So we're left with 28 equaling four. That's sweet. And then we're left with. Uh, plus 9 thirds is 3 pi dh dt. And so now it's starting to look a little more user friendly. 28 minus 4 will be 24. And if you divide through by 3 pi, you get dh dt. And you could stop there, or you could simplify, because 24 thirds comes out to be 8. So 8 over pi, and then inches per second. Wow, okay. And we had 15 minutes to do that. We're still not done. That's probably going to be worth another three points, I'm guessing, somewhere in there. And now we're on to part C. When you get to a free response question, usually the last part, not always, but the last part is the one, is the one that makes you go, hmm. Things that make you go, hmm as C&C Music Factory sang about after 1984. That was more like 1992, 91. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was after, yeah. Part C, at the instant when the radius of the cone is three inches. I remember that moment. What is the instantaneous rate of change of the area of its base didn't we already do that? With respect to its height. Oh, that's an interesting one, right? Things that make you go, hmm. All right. The rate of change of the area with respect to the height. So I'm looking for D A D, not T, but H. How am I going to do that? How can we express the area of the base in terms of the height? Any idea? No? Hmm. Well, let's see. One, one option is to mess around with the chain rule. Uh, if you remember the mousetrap 
thing when we did the chain rule? We either like D something, D something, D something, D something, D something, and then they all divide it out. So maybe I could go like DA, DT, and then times, and if I want DH in the bottom, I could do that. What would have to be in the top? DT, right? These differentials work out that way. That would give me my DTs to divide out, and I would end up with DH, DT. Okay, that's something to work with. Now, DTDH looks kind of funky, right? But all DTDH is, it's the reciprocal of DH, DT. So if I know what DA, DT is, and I know what DH, DT is, I think I could, like, flip the second one and have it. Do we know what DA, DT is? Teachers and students, please try this interruption. A couple of announcements. All students planning on participating in track this year, even if you are in another sport at this time, there is a mandatory parent meeting January the 13th at 6 o'clock in the Blue Room. Please make arrangements with Coach Starnes or Coach Harvey if you can't make it. Also, NHS candidates, you're reminded that all candidate information, including the application, references, and documentation of service hours are due on or before Friday, January the 8th, which is today. No extensions will be granted. Please see Ms. Gray if you've got any questions in room 103. All right. Um, okay. Sorry. Please turn your TVs to channel four for the morning announcements, or you can view them on your iPads at nbhstv.com. Cool. All right. So DADT, the equation is is pretty easy. DHDT, I could solve all this for DHDT. So I'm not going to do it with variables, and they didn't want you to do it that way. That's why they said at the instant when the radius of the cone is three. So we can actually look at the quantities that we discovered. So. The ADT we found on part A. What did we find it to be on part A? We found the ADT to be 3 pi. Yeah? 3 pi inches per second. Now, I'm going to include units here. 3 pi inches squared per second. The HDT, where did we find the HDT? We just found it in part B, right? It's 8 over pi inches per second. 8 over pi inches per second. So if I come over here, we'll say then at the moment in time when R is 3, that's what they're referencing, dA dH is going to equal dA dT, which I just found to be 3 pi inches squared. I'm going to go ahead and say per second. I'm doing a little bit of stoichiometry here as well. And how do I get dT dH if I know dH dT? flip it, right? So this becomes pi over 8, and instead of inches per second, it's seconds per inch. This is one of the advantages of using Leibniz notation with the differentials. And I don't think you'd have to simplify that, but let's go for it. Uh, what do I end up with? I end up with 3 pi squared eighths. And what happens with the units? I get inches squared per inch. And I think we looked at this earlier in the year. Do you want to divide those out and call it inches? If you do, you kind of lose uh, a little bit of what the question is asking. So you would say, at the moment when the radius is 3, the area is increasing by 3 pi square inches, a 3 eighths pi squared inches squared per 1 inch change in the height. So for every time the height increases by an inch, the area is going to increase by 3 pi squared eighths square inches. So notice what they did. They ask you to do something in part A. They ask you to do something in part B. And in part C, you got to use what you did in part A and B in kind of a novel way. And that's a very typical thing where they, they have you do stuff like that. So um, we don't really look at the chain rule all that often with Leibniz notation. We tend to do it with function notation, but Leibniz notation does have its advantages because you could treat them as rates, and of course you could flip rates uh, as needed. And we'll be doing a lot of that kind of stuff too later on when we get to um, polar coordinates. All right, that's it. That would be probably another, that last one might be worth just two points. Usually the one that makes you go, hmm, they don't load that one up with a lot of points. It's usually worth like one or two points. So those are kind of the fun ones. If you kind of shape your, your mind to think that the last ones are the fun ones, those are the ones that really require some novel thinking perhaps, the challenging ones. 
the fun ones, uh, you'll be doing yourself a favor instead of just saying, oh, it's the hard ones, I'm not going to do it. All right. Okay, we're done with the related rates. Any questions? What comes after related rates? Integrals. Yeah, we're we're about ready to start integration, which means we're going about we're going to be going backwards. We're going to be doing undoing everything we just did. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So rates related. So have a have a splendid, fabulous weekend. Man, everything is sluggish today. Sluggish. <laughs>